So the token. Um, our goal for the token is to build a system that is inherently useful. Um, what does that mean? Uh, really creating something that our users want to use, not just having a token as this carrot drawing users to a system like, hey, this is something really cool. I have a solution to a problem you don't actually have. Here's a token to try to use this. Um, so our goal is really create something that's useful first, which is why actually we launched without the token to begin with and then adding the token. So how did we do that? Our development process is really defining the prime objective first, then what are our design considerations? What is the real value that we're providing here for our users? Who are the agents that are actually using this? Um, and then from there, looking at the stack that we have. What are all the tools that are available to us to actually achieve the prime objective that we have? What is the research out there, both in the blockchain literature like Medium, but, but also in existing economics literature as well. Uh, what are the methods that projects before us have used and what's failed, what's succeeded? Looking at all of these things together and then coming up with design version 0.1. But from there, that's just really the first step and we keep iterating on that and probably we'll have even more iterations than what we've had so far. So what are our prime objectives? Um, we really want the token to support and secure the use of Centrifuge OS without reliance on a centralized third party, so that includes Centrifuge the company, as well as accelerate its utility. Um, one thing that Philip mentioned before that I'm going to dive into a bit more is this global business graph. And we really think this is the long-term value of Centrifuge. So we want the token to support this as well, because we really think it's going to enable new types of financial services. So as Philip mentioned, you can factor an invoice today, but we think this business graph will enable new types of financing for that invoice, like instant financing, such as using a maker, um, multi-collateral die, um, or deep tier finance. One of the underlying assumptions that we have is that it's the utility of Centrifuge that's driving businesses to use our platform. So again, we're not trying to lure you in to use this product. We think this is really solving a problem that you have. And from there, the token is really just adding support to the objectives that we have. So what is the value of Centrifuge OS? And this is probably alluding to your question as well. What are companies getting out of this, right? So we're enabling companies to exchange financial documents in a private, secure, yet verifiable way. And at the same time, providing an unalterable single source of truth for all of the parties involved. How do the different businesses actually come at this? So a small, medium-sized business, they're getting more access to financial services. This tea grower may not have had any bank that would even give them the time of day before, but now that this bank has an unalterable source of truth for the data of this tea grower, they potentially get access to more financial services than they could have ever had before. The large corporate will get access to these services, but they also get a better system for their financial documents and supply chain data than they have today. Existing business networks like uh, other invoicing platforms or ERP systems, they also like Centrifuge. They don't just see us as someone who's coming in to replace them. And the reason is because they get a larger network of potential customers that they can offer other types of services to. For example, trade credit insurance. Um, a funder gets access to more accurate financial supply chain data and probably a more diverse range of potential customers as well. So each of these agents is utilizing the Centrifuge platform in a different way, but they're all getting value out of the network that we think this is what's driving them to use Centrifuge in the first place. So some examples of what they could look like, maybe a cotton farmer um, is a small medium, si small sized business um, doing business maybe with Nike. They might um, 
use a system, Nike uses a system for invoicing called TradeShift actually, and maybe Commerzbank is uh, funding that invoice. So the token model is then providing the underlying security for our platform, or this is what we want the token model to do. Uh, we want it to provide a distributed network of agents, and we also want it to give an additional incentive to perform these critical network functions that we have, and as well to do that early on. So that's part of this accelerating utility. We not only want the system to work, but it's the initial conditions of our system that also matter. And so providing an incentive to do all of these things right at the launch of our platform is actually going to be critical for us as well. Um, so to note um, again what it is not, it is not providing an extra incentive to use Centrifuge. We think that businesses want to use Centrifuge because it's useful and we're not trying to draw them to use this platform. So the tools that we use, um, the how that we're doing this. So the system architecture in our first version of the platform starts with the peer-to-peer -peer layer. This is where businesses are privately exchanging business documents. And within the peer-to-peer -peer layer is where we have the global business graph. So in order to use the peer-to-peer -peer layer, you will run a centrifuge node. And in order to be a part of the business graph as a node, you can also agree to be a graph contributor. And this is just allowing other businesses to query you, creating this queryable network of businesses that share their data and connections with each other. As well, we are creating a centrifuge specific sidechain. The purpose of the sidechain is to provide long-term and public verifiability of these business documents, as well as censorship resistance. In version 0.1, we also wanted to solve data availability. So one uh, element that we designed in addition to the peer-to-peer -peer layer and sidechain is what we call a keeper network. What the keeper network uh, is meant to do is provide continuously available access to off-chain encrypted business documents. So what did we want it to do? We wanted users to be able to go offline and you can still access the data. You can still request access to this document. You can get updates to this document without you having to be online all of the time. But we, at the same time, wanted this to be a trustless network. So that is why the business documents would be encrypted and we would use the token to incentivize this network of keepers. But this was part of our iteration that we felt like this adds a large degree of complexity. Although we really want to have data availability long term, this is something that isn't a need, a core issue that we want to solve right now. It's not the core purpose of Centrifuge and something that would be great, but don't need in the beginning of the network to have it function the way that can really be useful from the beginning. So diving a little bit deeper into this peer-to-peer -peer layer, again, you're running an operational node to be able to send and receive and validate your own private documents. So you're keeping all of this data private and you're only sharing it with parties that you know. The global business graph as well is directly with a party that you know. So maybe imagine this like um, the Lightning Network or Raiden where you're hopping between nodes that you actually have a direct connection with and not revealing private data or even the path that's taken to the party that potentially your query eventually reaches down the line. So in this way, we're keeping all of the data private, but at the same time accessible. Diving a little bit deeper into the public immutable ledger, also known as a blockchain, um, what do we really want this to be able to do? We want to be able to mint NFTs, and this is really providing the business document with verifiability. As Philip mentioned, Ethereum is really expensive, so using a sidechain that leverages the security and censorship resistance of an underlying blockchain, like Ethereum, 
um, while also enabling a higher level of scalability. So this is the real reason we wanted a sidechain and not just using Ethereum. Um, one of our design considerations for the sidechain was what type of consensus algorithm should we use that would create the most distributed decentralized type of system. And that's definitely debatable whether a proof of stake consensus algorithm can actually provide that. But this is what we decided to go with because we think that it will create a distributed network of validators um, that's maybe not as decentralized as something like Ethereum or Bitcoin, but decentralized for the purpose that we need it to be because we're not trying to provide that underlying security that the blockchain that, that we're a sidechain of would actually provide. So the point of the validators in our network are really to provide uh, a distributed system with no central point of failure or a central point of control, including, again, centrifuge. So the purpose of this ledger is really for any user to be able to monitor this public chain and be able to see updates to existing documents, uh, NFTs that are minted, identities, uh, and be able to then check with the party that uh, posted a new update to a document, um, maybe my invoice was paid. And this is all something that we could see on this public ledger. Diving a bit into our native token. So we, for now, are calling it Medallion. Um, I don't know if there are other names in the works, but um, one of the primary purposes of this token is really to provide value at stake for our sidechain. Um, as well as for the global business graph. So validators on the sidechain will stake medallion in order to be able to validate the sidechain. And businesses that want to allow other businesses to query them within the global business graph will also stake medallion as a security margin for the right to perform that work. We will give block rewards in medallion <coughs> as an additional incentive to perform those network functions. These block rewards um, will follow a supply schedule that is much steeper at the beginning of the network and lowers over time. And the idea here is really to incentivize work and accelerate it early in the, in the network's life. And doing this, allowing the network to achieve its highest value long term. There will also be transaction fees so the transaction fees will compensate validators as well as anyone contributing data to this business graph for actually doing the work. Um, as well, it will prevent spam and attacks on the network for just querying the global graph um, with thousands of requests and trying to bring the network offline. We also imagine that there will be governance that will utilize this native token medallion. So in this way, empowering our users, the users of Centrifuge, which could be users that are large corporates running their own um, Centrifuge nodes, and it could be also a small business that may, might not actually run their own node, but they might still wish to hold Medallion in order to participate in governance decisions. And finally, um, distribution mechanisms are also um, something that I think is getting a lot more attention right now. Um, a lot of different projects are diving into things like work lock tokens and um, lock drops. And I think this is something that's really necessary because the initial conditions of the system really affect the value long-term. This is something that is also true in economics in general. Any country that starts out with a certain type of wealth distribution can grow much faster if that wealth distribution is more equal over time. So I think this is something super important in token engineering that is getting a lot more deserved attention as of late. So taking a step back, what are the technical entities here? So we have the operational nodes, that is within the peer-to-peer -peer layer, validators for the sidechain, keepers for the data availability and the keeper network, graph contributors are operational nodes that are just allowing their data to be queried within the global business graph. And as well, delegators, because this is a proof of stake network, actually delegated proof of stake network, um, where 
if delegator, if a medallion holder doesn't want to run their own validator, they can delegate on other validators. So the objectives of design version 0.1 require staking for as well as incentivize validators for the sidechain, keepers for data availability, and businesses to share data. So we have data verification, data correctness, data availability, the global business graph, governance. Basically, we wanted to solve all the problems with version 0.1. And then we took a step back and we said, OK, maybe we don't have to solve all the problems right now and focus just on core functionality. So design version 0.2, focus on the core objectives. The rest is really nice to have, but we don't need it from day one. And we can for sure do it in the future, um, but we don't need to focus on that right now because we need to be focusing on our core product, solve the most important problems, which we think are data verification and data cor correctness, because we want to be able to tokenize documents. And that is something that is missing right now when you want to finance an invoice, having data verification. And the long-term value that we think is part of Centrifuge, the global business graph. So this is what we've chosen to focus on for design version 0.2. Um, and still think data availability is a problem that needs to be solved, uh, as well as governance, but parking them aside for now and focusing on what we can really give to users today or with the token design in the next year. So just recapping, peer-to-peer -peer layer, sidechain, global business graph. Any questions? So for the graph itself, uh, you said it was like constituted of all the graph contributors. So you may have like a uh, holes at some points in the supply chain if not everyone contributes to the graph. Is that like right? And um, if someone, for example, like the graph contributor reveals its own relationships. So, uh, but if uh, he's doing, like, if that uh, graph contributor is doing business with another entity that doesn't want that uh, relationship revealed, uh, is there like, um, like some kind of like consensus that they have to reach uh, for that to appear on the graph? Or if, the, if someone decides to contribute, everything will be uh, available immediately. So the idea is not, is that you wouldn't reveal anything actually, that the queries would be very specific and actually, I could have given a better example of, of how you would use the business graph, but one use case would be um, this deep tier finance that I want a uh, thousand euros of funding and I know you, I send it to you. I don't know who you send it to after I query you. I don't know who your relationships are. Um, say I send it to you, you can't fund the thousand euros, but maybe he can. And so because you have a direct business relationship, you can ask him for the thousand euros, but he won't know it's coming from me, actually. He will only know that it's coming from you. So in that way, we're keeping the privacy of the query of all of the parties involved. So I, I, I'm still wondering about like kind of, the, so if um, there's like a full privacy and you don't, like each user won't have like an internal representation of the global business graph. So the gra um, the graph contributors are here to like kind of root the uh, the invoice, for example, or something. It's to like to root queries within the network. Something. Yeah. So at any one time, no one would have a snapshot of what this graph looks like. Yeah. Okay. Really? Yeah. This is assured. I mean, there, is, there are various techniques for private information retrieval of big databases. I still don't have the feeling how privacy is assured here, I have to say. Because it's not a database. So it's private data that, that you have on your own node. And you only allow access, you only respond to a specific query. So the only data you're making available is the answer to a query. And the answer is coming directly from someone that you do business with, or the question is coming directly from someone you do business with. So you're trusting your business partner, but you're probably already trusting them 
with a lot more data than just that query. So it's more like a game theoretic security. Um, I, I don't know if I would say that, it's, but... Yeah, just to add to that, it's not only a game theoretic uh, security, but it's truly each of the requests is getting wrapped, so to say. So as Cassidy said, once a, this funding request is getting passed on to the next node, um, this node can then decide to pass it on, but for, for the receiving nodes, it seems like this request is actually coming from that middle node, but there's no way to find out that this request came originally from Cassidy. So it's not only a game theoretical uh, security in, in that sense. I mean, I, I think maybe it's game theoretical to the extent that when I invoice Nike, I don't expect Nike to publish all of my personal private data. But I, I mean, that's already, a, maybe that's just a, a, a social contract that we have in general. I could probably also sue Nike if they did that. So still falling back on traditional world, how things work. Um, but yeah, you're really only trusting the parties that you already do business with and you're already sharing personal data with. I have another question. Okay. Um, so in terms of the user experience, if you're like a business coming to the network and you want to use it to publish some invoice, uh, you have, some, in the token design, you'll have some fees and you get the service in return. Those fees are paid in the alliance or in like um, other, could also be paid in other like uh, more common uh, cryptocurrencies like that. That's a good question. So. This is something that went through a few iterations, actually. So the first iteration was, let's pay it in medallion, the native token. And then the thought is, well, it should be a token that has a stable value if validators want to liquidate this cost um, or liquidate this fee to be able to pay the cost that they have. Um, so it could be a, a currency like DAI like a stable currency, uh, it could be an ETH because we're building on Ethereum and you would have to pay gas fees to Ethereum miners as well for um, transferring the NFT from the sidechain to Ethereum if you wanted to use it on a platform like Dharma or Maker. Um, so we could potentially use other currencies. I think the cool thing now is that we could potentially use several different currencies actually. Um, and there is, I think, a good argument for using Medallion in the beginning as the transaction fee when we first launch. Even though it's going to be fluctuating, it's likely that all the validators on our platform in the beginning are interested in holding Medallion. And they're probably going to be able to cover their costs anyway. So there are different elements that we have to take in consideration when we think about fees. But ideally, long term, you could use several different currencies. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Um, so we also thought exactly like, why do you use the medallion? And then we went on this kind of thought, we can use any currency and then, okay, then every participant has to hold any potential currency to do this. And then actually we talked to people who run validators for networks. And then they said exactly what Cassidy just said. It's like, yeah, we join a network early on because we want the native token. Like we, that's what we bet on, that yeah. this token will gain value. Like we don't care about $10,000 or 20,000 or whatever in like, um, utility bills. We want to join the network because we want to get access to that to the token. And from the other side, from a user's perspective, we're going to be denominating this fee in fiat as well. Um, so you could argue that from a user's perspective, it creates a little bit of friction. But I think because of the state of decentralized exchanges that we have now, it would be pretty easy actually to use Medallion as a transaction fee. So. If you talked to me six months ago, I might not have actually answered with that, but um, I think we're getting closer and closer to a better user experience with using native tokens. Mm -hmm. do, you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about what the staking requirements are to play in the, in the sense that like we, we talked about slashing conditions and these kind of things where we didn't dive at all or at, at this point not di dive into that? Um, because it's a work token, essentially, this Brazilian yeah. token. I don't know if that was clear for everybody. Was it clear? Are there any questions around how you could be a validator on Centrifuge? So, so what drives the value of Medallion is actually the question. So it's, it's not a stable coin. It's, it's meant to, it's a work token. Govern, to govern this sidechain, right? 
Governance is one aspect, but it's primarily, I mean, I would argue it's primarily a work token. Sorry. Um, I can imagine other projects arguing that governance is more important, um, but I would say for us, it's primarily value at stake, creating a security deposit that we can slash if you misbehave on our platform. Um, so one way you could think of value that you're getting out of this is if I stake um, 10,000 euros worth of medallion, I can earn X in fees and also earn X or Y in block rewards. So you can think about it in, in the terms of what you're actually making as profit by running a validator and how much you have to stake in order to make that kind of profit. Is the value in anyhow connected to the behavior of the buyer and seller in, so that do business with each other? Is this somehow connected? They pay their bills or make lots of transactions or just once a year. Is this somehow connected to we the size about of the business growth? Is this somehow connected to the value of the coin? I would say initially there was the idea that we could reward businesses for transacting more on the platform. But that's what we decided not to do, that we don't have to incentivize a business to come use this. We think it's going to be inherently useful for them. So I wouldn't say that the value of the token directly depends on the value of an invoice between two businesses, but I would say it does depend on businesses using the platform. So the more businesses use the platform, the more validators are going to make in fees, the more important governance will be as well. And I think both of those things will play into the value of this token, um, as well as potentially with the glo global business graph as it grows, needing to stake and also receiving value from queries within this graph could also add meaningful value to the token. Uh, the consideration is that factoring uh, companies, they are mostly uh, mostly as well rating agencies, rating organizations, or they share the same building with them, share information with them as the main part of the business model, where it's mostly not clear what is the income which comes from factoring and what's it, I mean, it's factoring just a, might be currently just a side product of rating agencies. So my, my question is, uh, do you have plans uh, to go in the rating agency business field? Uh, or because it might be more valuable, because if the company is doing some factoring, the company might be already in trouble. So it might be not a very small business idea to go factoring, but just better in rating. Yeah, it's, I mean, can I take us? <laughs> um, You're the expert there. Yeah. Um, so we had earlier a question, I think, from you about the um, reputation, right? So it's reputation is an inher inherent part, or like, did you have this, this history is an inherent part of the network itself, and who is making sense out of that on top? Um, it can be an existing rating agency, it can be somebody else. Ourselves, we're not, like, we're really more focused on building the network and enabling then applications on top of that. So we work with banks uh, together mm -hmm to get access to these, to these assets and how they do and make sure that they have all the data that they need to do underwriting. But it's not us um, to wanting to do that. Yeah. You can also think about that. Actually, some things that we haven't mentioned, I'm just realizing now is uh, we talked really about the functionality of the core pieces, but we also talked about what could this token be used in addition. So when there's no reputation yet, maybe if you stake some additional medallion, you um, you can create a little bit more trust initially, like that somebody would underwrite you more favorably uh, and these kind of things. So the token that's really part of this financial system can also enable other things like trust seeding um, and so on. But again, it's not core of the, core, uh, the, the objectives that Cassidy described, like securing the network and providing the unalterable source of truth that would be like nice additions on top, potentially. Another interesting thing that you could do is um, with regards to credit analysis, I guess, uh, maybe some other DAP wants to create NFT registries and they would analyze what your NFT was worth and they would only allow your NFT to be registered in this list if it met certain criteria. 
and that can make it even easier for some funder to come along. Um, so that could definitely be a service that's charged for on top um, by another DAP. So totally, if I understand this correctly, so totally you say, okay, basically the information is private, but there might all kinds of additional services emerge based on that protocol which require additional information, but then this is up to specific services and also then supply and demand question if um, the businesses um, on both sides are willing to give this information to get certain benefits or whatever. And it could also be that you only have the ability to share with the funder specific fields that you wouldn't be able to share the entire document with someone else. Potentially. Absolutely. But when we talk about rating, then of course you need specific information, and otherwise it doesn't work. But it, I guess it wouldn't have to be everything. It would just be those specific things. And you would then trust this rating agency with that information. But maybe using this NFT registry example, once it's in this registry, then all of the information can remain private. You only shared it with that one rating agency that then allowed your NFT to be registered in this list, but everyone else has no, yeah, no idea. They just know that it was rated to maybe have this kind of risk. And so they're able to charge 2% because it's in that kind of risk profile, for example. Anything else? <laughs> yeah. Is it already a fee structure or some assumption about how What's the amount of fees you plan to put? We've estimated based on how much these um, actions cost on Ethereum, what it might cost on a sidechain. I think that's ultimately something we're going to find through practice, but we have modeled some idea of, of what it could look like. Um, and I think another thing that's important to consider is how our block rewards are going to play into that as well. We imagine that it would push fees very low in the beginning, actually, to almost zero, um, because these validators are making so much in a block reward that they might not need to charge high fees because they don't really need to cover their costs anyway. So um, I think, again, something that will be solved by the market, but worth modeling in the beginning. I have opinions about simulations, but I think it's it's important for us to think about it and reason if this is something that would actually be um, useful to a business. Is it going to be so expensive that they wouldn't want to use this on Ethereum mainnet? Yes. On a sidechain, we do think it's going to be um, cheap enough to actually be beneficial to these companies. A question uh, with regards to the medallion token. So there, I think I saw six different functionalities or um, yeah, targets. These uh, this token could or purposes this to token could serve. Is there is it just the example or are you really going for having just one single token? Because I remember the talk last week. Some of you might too. Um, in Gnosis and DX DAO, it's totally different. You have various purposes and almost for every single purpose, a different token. So is this, uh, let's say, something you say we need to push for have a single token? Or is it just because this is, a, let's say, um, something that needs to be refined or verified if it's just one token in the total system because i mean governance is totally different from block rewards again different from staking and you might need to change things in in one system but then this interferes mm -hmm. with with another system and of course this adds complexity so at first sight it looks easier to handle various purposes by one single token and be in a sense independent then I think that's something we could take a super deep dive into um, because there's, I think there's so many different considerations there. As, as one example, I really think value at stake needs to be used with block rewards. I don't think it works otherwise. 
Um, if you're rewarded in a currency other than what you're staking, then there's no way for you to meaningfully increase your stake in the system to then make more rewards or make more fees. So those two, I think, need to really be aligned. Um, governance on top of that is a completely different deep dive that we could take. How to approach governance. Should you even use tokens with regards to governance? Should it be off-chain? Should you use identity? Well, we'd love to use identity, but we don't have identity, really. Or we don't want to force that on our users as well. So governance using the native token, I think, the way that we have it set up now to use on-chain token-based voting, I think it should be the same token that's used as a value at stake or used by the primary function of the network. So in our network, it's validators as well as the graph contributors. And as they're building up stake, they should be able to use that with regards to governance. Um, but at the same time, if you're a delegator, and you're staking on a validator, you shouldn't necessarily also be staking on them to vote on your behalf. So separating the governance function of the token from using it for work. So separate in a sense, but, but still the same token that's at play there. I'd be really curious if there's a project that's separating it. I'd wonder if that would work well. Um, for transaction fees, in our first iteration, we actually did think about using a second token for that. I don't think, I think if you do use a second token, it shouldn't be your own native token, because I think it's a wasted effort to try to create your own stable currency if you're also focused on a completely different, unique product. Leave it to MakerDAO to figure that out, or USD coin, or whatever other project that's really tar targeting a stable currency. I think it's unnecessary to spread your resources that thin to try to tackle so many different things at the same time. Um, I mean, we could have said the same about data availability with the Keeper network, that we want to focus on core functionality. We don't even want to focus on data availability at the moment, let alone also having a stable currency to use as a transaction fee. Um, I guess those are my major thoughts about that. But I do think it's something that you could dive in super deep about whether to use several different tokens in your system or just one. Um, from an economics perspective, I personally think the more complexity in the token, the better. At the same time, you don't have to introduce governance at the same time as validators staking at the same time as keepers in the system. So reaching an equilibrium first and then introducing the next agent within the system after that, we'll then reach another equilibrium instead of potentially starting both at the same time and they're competing and they have the same goal, but you always have this constant instability in the system potentially. So I would definitely argue more on the side of complexity instead of having single tokens, single purpose tokens. Um, but I'm sure there are people who disagree with me. I feel like we could dive super deep. Yeah. And that's when we said earlier <clears throat> about being pragmatic, so to mm -hmm. say, it's like in, in version 0 0.2, I think actually you took out the governance also as a main bullet. Yeah. But because we said, it's, let's get these people to stake and validate mm -hmm. and so on. And then, I mean, in reality, uh, some entity that's also developing the protocol is actually going to have the most governance influence anyways mm -hmm. in the beginning. And then once we have a stable system, then decentralizing governance and is that then mm. to staking the same token but in different pools, so to say, or could you then issue new tokens for the holders of them that are purely governance tokens? Those are those are options. Um, again, like we're more taking one step at a time, but yeah, it's definitely uh, opinion ripe uh, field. But I do think. To me, it makes sense to have more complexity for stability in the value of that token to actually be able to reach an equilibrium. Um, the more value you have in that one token, the more stable it's going to be. And I think it also enhances the security there. If there's a lot of value in that one token, you have that much more security. If that value is spread across five different tokens, you have much less security within the network. So you say complexity to some degree equals value? Complexity, I think, adds value 
if you have several different elements that are adding value within that complexity. So not complexity for the sake of it, mm -hmm. but complexity meaning having validators and keepers using the same token, and they're both charging fees, they're both providing unique value to the system, so adding value on top of each other instead of spreading it thin with their own tokens. First, uh, you mentioned in the long term that the business graph is going to provide more value. Um, how exactly could you, could you kind of give a, like a concrete example uh, or use case of the business graph that could do that? Well, that was all the way back in. This is, I mean, I think this was the, the primary example there of, of using the business graph. Right. Uh, so. If I understand correctly, like if if A transacts with B and B transacts with C, does if if B becomes this point which connects them, does A know that's A know that it's connected to C and hence can bypass B? No. Or, okay. So that would be retaining the privacy within the system. Say the cotton grower wants financing, they would only directly ask to the fabric factory. And if they can't provide financing, they might ask shoelaces. And shoelaces says, yes, I can give financing. Cotton grower would have no idea that it came from shoelaces. And so they would actually get funding directly from this fabric factory. And fabric factory would get funding from shoelaces. So we're actually, in that way, also minimizing the risk that's involved because we're ensuring that there's an open invoice here between these two players. Um, so in that way, really ensuring that you are only taking the risk of the, the highest um, or the largest business in that chain. So, so deep tier finance is one of the first examples that actually people are interested in because you can finance these supply chains um, that just previously have not been able to finance that way. Um, similarly to what we just talked earlier about, like an in, we took the in example of one invoice being sent between, there's a purchase order, da da da. You can also think about different types of messages being passed around the business graph. And you could conceive of a message that gets passed all the way to the end, like to like the leaf of, a, of the path, and then reveals to the original sender. Like somebody could create a message like that, but in a deep tier finance case, um, that's, not really, that's not really the case. It's something like the degrees of connectedness. And the more number of connected nodes you have, the higher the chance of it traveling all the way till that. Yeah, yeah, you can see that. And, and for us in DTF Finance, how do you bring financing, like with this specific use case, how do you bring financing to the people who are on the end of the lease who, not, who don't have that kind of that trust so you can inherit that? Just to give another example, maybe to give a better idea of the whole picture, say that there was another company here that could also give financing to the cotton grower. Now they might have an option, but they're both still coming from fabric factory, but they have two options of the funding of maybe two different interest rates that would be charged, for example. So you could still do it both ways. Did you have a question? Uh, there are so many security assumptions in this whole ecosystem, mm -hmm. and it's a basically layered ecosystem, starting with POW and the mining industry centralization to delegated proof of stake and the game theoretic uh, um, assumptions. And then you have maybe MegaDAO and, and uh, those risks involved there. And uh, I wonder all these risks, they, they clump together at a single point in time, right? when a transaction is made. What is basically the worst that can happen? What is the worst case here? If everybody, if everything breaks down, what is, how, how is the system trickable? Well, what is basically at risk here? What's the skin in the game? I mean, worst case really could be anything. I'll start with anything. Well, I, just starting from there, but I think in the examples that we see this being used in the most, you would be real world businesses and you would know each other's identity. So that does reduce a lot of the risk here to begin with. What we want our sidechain to accomplish 
is the public verifiability of, of this document data. And what you could do there is try to censor transactions. Um, but I don't, I mean, do you have any other worst case scenarios? So, so yeah, from, from the sidechain perspective, we're not trying to create a whole new proof of work or proof of stake network, right? So when you, uh, you mentioned that earlier as well, plugging into the uh, um, existing network security of Ethereum or a Polkadot um, allows us to like continuously have the unalterability and like you cannot rewrite history unless you break Ethereum, but then all of the stuff anyways, you can throw out of, out of the window. Um, so from that sense, yeah, you could censor something if you're not accepting transactions on a sidechain. I think, so when we did our security audit recently, I mean, they also asked us like, what would be the worst case for your Merkle tree hashing thing? And then we said, well, you could create proofs that are invalid. And then they went through and I found a bug and then we fixed it. I mean, there's a lot of security considerations in that sense, or when, I mean, maybe there is a bug in the implementation of one of the clients and it leaks all of your data instead of just passing certain fields, but well, then all of your data is leaked. But you also have that in a traditional system today, right? If QuickBooks Online has a bug and then all of the data is leaked. So I'm not sure, um, yeah, in, in, in that sense, and if, and that's what you meant, I think what you meant, anything could happen. I think all of these have different meanings. If Maker does not keep its peg and all of a sudden loses all its value, well, then all of the transactions that you're doing right now in DAI, uh, so if DAI doesn't keep its peg, then, then it's going to be, you're losing money. But that's, yeah, I think we have to really talk about the specific pieces. Yeah, it would be better if we narrowed down on, on worst case, in which sense. <laughs> Because there's lots of different, I mean, I could come up with lots of different examples, but... That's the problem with risk aggregation that actually... But I think this is already problem. exists in the real world. As, as you mentioned, if you use QuickBooks, you already have that. If you transact in dollars, I mean, it's unlikely that the dollar would lose value, but it's still possible. Um, if you transacted with British pounds, well, you've lost a lot of value in the past couple of years. So there's always risks associated with anything that we use, and they're all risks built on top of each other. Um, so I think that's the system is not immune to that. I think I'm more into the black swan type of thing. You know this 2008 type of thing that can happen in the central system, uh, in the centralized system, can actually happen here as well. And maybe not today, of course, because the volume is too small, but uh, in 10 years from now, maybe, uh, and that, therefore, I'm interested in the aggregation of risks. And if you thought about this. I think that's fair. I mean, to give you another example, if a lot of the value of the token of a lot of different projects is just based on speculation, and that's the primary value that they have at stake, and all of a sudden a bubble bursts somewhere, then you basically have no value at stake and you have no incentive to behave properly within the system because you already lost all of your money, so you have nothing else to lose, for example. So I think that is something to be aware of, but I think having a system where you keep that in mind and you design around that potential is important. Um, designing around black swan events, that's, that's something that's probably contentious within, within design. How much of a black swan event should we design around? How much security margin do we need to feel safe? Um, so that's fine. I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, could the directionality of the graph somehow indicate some kind of frauds that are going on? Just to, like, could you do like some higher evaluation of the graph to get uh, statistics like some kind of transactions to look fraudulent or something like that? Well, you wouldn't have a picture of the whole graph. You'd only have a picture of your direct business partners. Maybe you would be able to ask your business partner enough questions to see if he's frauding someone. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can think of attacks. I mean, like you can ask, I mean, and attacks, I guess it's more than how is the implementation of the actual querying or the message passing. Where if I ask all of my partners for funding and um, you time the response it takes, then you can figure out did they pass this message along or not. So then you have to develop the the node that kind of does the passing in a way that 
um, would hide like a time delay or add a time delay and, and these kind of things. I'm pretty sure there will be attacks that start to try to map out these kind of things that just will happen. Um, yeah, I mean, then we really have to look at what are, what are potential attacks and try to mitigate them as, as good as possible. Mm. I would add that's something that we'll learn in time as the system actually gets used, and then we might see some potential attacks that are tried. I think the same thing happens now with use single-use wallets for your crypto and people becoming more and more aware that it's actually really important that you do that if you want to maintain privacy. Um, and lots of services being developed around that very attack now that you can use. So maybe something like that happens in the future where another DAP comes in and says, hey, use this service and we prevent such and such attacks. Yeah, I think one, one big consideration for us is really, how can we make sure that the data is correct? And that's really with each of the exchanges that you create this anchor and it, on a blockchain that is not alterable because then from there, everything else derives. So if that fails for us, if basically there is a bug in um, that you can like, have malleability in the in the in the data that would suck